In your favorite franchise, which game do you think is the most overlooked one? 2021 marks Zelda's 35th anniversary, so that naturally got the series in my mind, and I reflected on my own question which brought off a few games. The Minish Cap, the Oracle games, and the DS games. Whether you agree or not, we can discuss that some other time. But what I'm trying to say is that this got me in the mood to revisit Zelda Phantom Hourglass and Zelda Spirit Tracks. These two have always been interesting games. First, because personally, I barely see people talk about them. And second, because these are some of the most unique entries in the series. I always found them fascinating due to their unique gimmicks and the fact that I grew up with them. 2008 to early 2010 was a period of time for me that was mostly dominated by the Nintendo DS, so I was able to vaguely recall good things about these titles. For this video, I want to bring attention to these seemingly overlooked games. I'll be checking both of them, starting with Phantom Hourglass and finishing with Spirit Tracks. So, Phantom Hourglass is the game I have the least memories of. I recall getting it as a gift from a cousin that went to the US, and at some point in life, it suddenly vanished from my collection. Was it stolen? Did I sell it? I genuinely don't know. If I played this in 2008, then I must have been 10 years old, and I haven't replayed it since then. I'm currently 23, so my memories about the game were very hazy, but I could at least recall a few keywords related to Phantom Hourglass, those being uh, touch controls, uh, great puzzles, Temple of the Ocean King, and Limbeck. Why don't we look at them in order? As all of us are aware, the DS had a touchscreen which was pretty new at the time. Unless you're gonna count the game comp, but we don't talk about that. The touchscreen was pretty good for rhythm and puzzle games, although in the end you could say it was mostly a gimmick. And you know what that means. Gimmicky console, first party Nintendo title, eh, eh, see where this is going? That means Nintendo will force that gimmick into your game whether you like it or not. And this was the result of that philosophy. Zelda Phantom Hourglass is 99% a touchscreen game. Moving around, picking objects, attacking, using items, sailing, all of that is done with the stylus. Only exceptions to the rule are occasionally blowing into the mic or using buttons for menu shortcuts. This is without a doubt the main reason as to why people are wary on approaching the DS titles. And I really understand that. Nobody likes shitty gimmicks if they are not fun, counterintuitive, or don't bring anything to the table. I think I just described my feelings towards Star Fox Zero, maybe I should cover that some other day. Anyway, that's where I want to step in and defend Phantom Hourglass. Look, personally I would prefer a more traditional control skin, but the game's insistence on using the console's gimmicks actually benefit them in unique ways. First of all, the control. This part is weird to explain, because I played the game on a Wii U with a vertical display so I could get footage from both screens. And given the bulk of this godforsaken tablet, I think you can imagine this wasn't the most comfy way to play Zelda. I also don't think the Wii U's touchscreen is as smooth as the DS or 3DS. But you know what? It wasn't that bad. It took me a while, but to my surprise, it eventually felt pretty nice. Moving Link around was responsive. I didn't have many problems with accidentally falling off cliffs as long as I was watching my step. Attacking enemies simply by tapping them was more than enough to get the job done. And it was the same for sailing on ship. There was never a time where I was fighting against the camera 
or had issues blasting off enemies. The only drawbacks I experienced were for rolling around and doing horizontal slashes with the sword. The latter in particular could get a bit troublesome for those fights that involved the dead man Bolly. But outside of that, it was smooth sailing! Ah! But control is only one part of the equation. Because if you just consider that aspect, then these games don't have much reason to be full touchscreen. Luckily, there's more to them. And that is how they implement the capabilities of the DS in fun and different ways. Main evidence? The second keyword! Great puzzles! Even though my memories of the game were very blurry, I could vividly remember how much fun I had with a lot of the puzzles. Phantom Hourglass was able to achieve this by taking full advantage of the DS's unique features. For example, the two screens. While the lower one focuses on doing literally everything, the upper screen works as a map and a notepad of sorts. This game really encourages you to take notes at any given moment, as it emphasizes challenges that have a bit more thought behind them, normally giving you hints beforehand so you can apply them later on sometimes even asking you to think outside of the box and... This is seriously my favorite part about these games! They have more build-up to them, which increases the sense of reward upon completion. Let me put this in perspective. There's this puzzle that involves you interrogating people to find the imposter among us. I could have simply made random guesses and reload a safe state until I got it right but I still decided to do it the way it was intended. On another island, I could have easily looked up a guide on what symbol I should draw to proceed and save me a lot of time. But I still wanted to figure that out myself. Why else would I go through all that trouble? Because it's very fun to do it on your own. One puzzle that always stuck with me was the Uncharted Island a place that you literally have to draw the entire map of to solve a riddle. This was a time when I barely had internet access, I couldn't look up how to solve it. So having to figure this stuff out myself at such a young age was so... You just never forget that feeling. And Phantom Hourglass has a lot of cool moments like that. But what surprised me the most is that it was still able to catch me off guard at times. The first boss, Blast, is super simple. You have to make its three copies merge together with the boomerang. For some reason at first I wasn't getting any results. But it wasn't until I looked at the upper screen and noticed their icons had differing numbers of horns. So by hitting them in order 1, 2, 3, the rest of the fight became a no-brainer. It was so Dumb, but that made me laugh. It's the small things that make you go, Wow, I'm a fucking dumbass! One thing I wanna make note of is that this is the first Zelda game that doesn't introduce a new item. All the ones you have are brought back from past entries. And it's funny, cause that isn't an issue in the slide test. Because thanks to the game's unique features, most of them get a different functionality that gives them new air, and their usage doesn't run out as soon as you finish a temple cause they still serve a purpose later on. Whether it be puzzles or boss battles, they are very fun to use. Speaking of, I fucking love the boss battles in this game. I already mentioned Blast, that was cool, but there are a lot of standouts here. Craigs was genius by using the top screen as a first-person perspective to shoot him in the face. And Neox, ooh, it was so cool bringing down a golem with your hammer. All of this makes Phantom Hourglass sound like a really good game. But after this playthrough I can say... It is! But then there was something else. Something that people really hate about it. And that is actually the next keyword the Temple of the Ocean King. 
This place is infamous among Zelda fans. Easily the biggest point of discussion in this game. For those who are not aware, the Temple of the Ocean King is an area that must be revisited a minimum of 5 times in order to beat the game. Problem is, every time you return, you are forced to start from the beginning and redo all the challenges and puzzles. And to spice things up, you are forced to deal with phantoms. These huge chunks of armor that you cannot kill and the whole place will suck the life out of you unless you're in a safe area or have enough time left on the titular phantom hourglass. With that I think you now get the idea that people loathe this place. But can I be real with you for a moment? My main memories about this place were death, death and death. Ironically that forced me to overcome my fear of dying in Zelda, but anyway, now that I have replayed this again, the Temple of the Ocean King isn't as bad as I remember it. Yes, having to do everything again does suck. But I think this also highlights a clever design. Because every time you return, you already have an idea of what to do. And now that you are back with new items, you have new ways to overcome those challenges, which often result in getting treasures and finding shortcuts. I also forgot that there was a checkpoint that takes you to the halfway point, which saved me a lot of time. So yeah! This place was much better than I remember it being. I understand its design is not everyone's cup of tea, but me? I love finding new alternatives, and I love the challenges that come with time limits. Huh, maybe that's why I like Pikmin and Dead Rising so much. Then we have the last thing I remember about the game. Limbeck! First reason, I just found out I've been pronouncing his name wrong for 13 years, so fuck me, I better fix that! The second reason? I've always said that some of my favorite Zelda characters are Groose, Midna and Limebeck, and there's not much science behind that. He's a selfish coward, but one that grows as a person and can pull his weight when it matters. A highlight for sure, but the other characters and the story are something extra to enjoy. The characters are not super deep or anything, but they are likable, and in Zelda that's enough for me. The story is good, it's very standard honestly, but I enjoy the mystery behind the Ocean King and the ghost ship. And I appreciate when it tries to do something a little bit different by not relying on Ganon. And nothing against the dwarf, I fucking love him! But I also think a sea monster from hell is a very welcome addition. So, what else can I add? I believe the playthrough I did for this video was beneficial, cause it made me appreciate Phantom Hourglass on a higher level. Consider this, forced gimmicks are a huge risk, because even if they are good, not everyone is bound to like them. And that is a breaking point, if you cannot get used to the touch controls, you just won't like it. Easy as that, but at least for me, I'll give this game credit, because it knew how to have its own identity by making clever use of all the features of the DS while justifying its different control scheme. You know which Zelda I don't like? Twilight Princess! But don't misunderstand, I love that game, but I hate playing the Wii version, because most of its motion controls are nothing but glorified button presses that also overcomplicate simple actions. But then you have the other Zelda game on the Wii, Crossbow Training. I'm joking, I meant Skyward Sword. I don't have any negative feelings towards the motion controls in that game, because it was built with those in mind. And from the three playthroughs I have done, they have always worked well. And that's how I feel about Phantom Hourglass. After 13 years of not touching it, I can say... This was a very solid experience. The next game, however, was luckier than the last one. 
because Zelda Spirit Tracks is the one that still remains on my game shelf. Ah! I think I got this as a Christmas present from my godparents in 2009, but my last playthrough was actually in early high school, year 2013, see? I even have evidence on my 3DS. It's because of that that my memories on this game are clearer, but just for the sake of consistency, let's also bring out the keywords. So if you were to ask me, what do I think of when you mention Spirit Tracks, I will say multiplayer, uh, improvement, the Spirit Train, and Zelda. Once again, let's explore them in order. I'm starting with the multiplayer this time, because there's really not much I can say. It's something I barely played, but kinda remember for some reason? Both games on the DS featured a battle mode, with players alternating between playing as Link or a Phantom, with the goal being stealing more force gems than your opponent without getting coughed. That was the general idea and I remember it having power-ups and many arenas to play in? Unfortunately, that's where my knowledge ends. I wish I could have tried it again, but on a Wii U that is impossible. We know the online for the DS is death, and even if I could find someone to play with locally, I wouldn't be able to record any of it. I just wanted to mention the multiplayer because it's a pretty obscure mode in Zelda history. I don't know many people who got to experience it. So anyway, let us move on to Spirit Tracks by checking the next keyword. Improvement! Simply put, this game is superior in almost every single way. The control. I don't know if I was just used to playing on the gamepad, but simply moving around felt better. Actions such as rolling were easier to execute and attacking by drawing lines suddenly wasn't a problem anymore. The only time I ever had issues was with the spirit flute. To play it, you match the colors and blow on the mic. Easy as that. But the problem is, this thing only works when it feels like it. Because I was constantly messing up simple songs. And I don't know who to blame. Was it the gamepad's mic? Is it the game's fault? Or are my lungs that fucked up already? I think it's the second, because I can even recall having the same problem back in 2013. I found myself blowing air in different ways, but every time I will get different results. Remember that Spongebob episode where Squidward struggles to make a bubble? That's how it feels. This thing blows. Ha! <laughs> back to the positives. To differentiate Spirit Tracks from its predecessor, most of the items in this game are new. A whip to swing around and take away shields, a propeller that can get rid of poisonous areas, and a sand wand. What a great item that is! So good, it was even made into a weapon in Hyrule Warriors. And once again, they make all the dungeons you visit so fun and different from one another, while also delivering creative puzzles and top-notch boss battles. Kragma! This is one of the few names I have always remembered because his fight is the best in the game. And I think the developers knew because he's the only boss with an official art this detailed. And speaking of something similar, the presentation is a step up. The menus are more intuitive and everything is more organized. The character models look cleaner, there's more detail in their expressions, there's far more cutscenes this time around, and I also feel like the colors stand out better. The setting is much more varied. Not like Phantom Hourglass didn't offer different areas every now and then, but they are clearly more defined in Spirit Tracks. The Overworld is a good example of this. I love how, while traveling, you can be in one realm but still be able to recognize another one far off in the distance. For the DS, that sure is impressive. But without a doubt, the greatest improvement that Spirit Tracks made over its predecessor is its equivalent of the Temple of the Ocean King. 
The Tower of Spirits serves the same purpose. A dungeon you must revisit numerous times in order to progress. But, but, now you don't have to worry about redoing the same puzzles over and over. If you unlock a new area, you can access it right away. And rejoice, people who hate time limits, because the place no longer saps your life. I want to think this was done to develop more elaborate puzzles and an extremely important mechanic, but I'll get to that later. Wanna know what other improvement also rivals the Tower of Spirits in my opinion? The soundtrack. Yo, yo, yo! Ah! I didn't mention it when I talked about Phantom Hourglass because it's not very good. It's generic, it's forgettable, and its best tracks are rearrangements of other Zelda games. Except Linebeck's thing. That song is really good. But then comes the Spirit Tracks who says, Hey! I'm actually gonna try this time! Most towns share the same thing. But you wouldn't notice it, because they all have different compositions that fit with their setting. Others are entirely original. There's far more variety for the dungeons, the boss themes are so upbeat and climactic, and the cherry on top, the overworld theme. What a beautiful song that tells you what Spirit Tracks is all about. It goes without saying that everything I have mentioned up to this point can be considered an improvement over Phantom Hourglass. And it makes sense. The developers knew what worked, they were already used to the DS, so it only makes sense they went all out. But there has always been one thing that leaves me mixed. I like it more, but I also kinda don't. That being the Spirit Train. I'm aware I didn't say much about sailing in Phantom Hourglass because... I don't really have much to say. I mean, you draw your curse, shoot a few things, salvage treasure, play a really fun fishing minigame, solve a few puzzles, or occasionally discover new islands. For me, sailing is just that, a thing you have to do and enjoy. But the spirit train in Spirit Tracks leaves me all over the place. There's things that can be considered improvements, but also drawbacks. For example, traveling. Since the train, obviously, has to stay on tracks, the amount of roads you can take to your destination is limited. Sure, you can unlock extra roads by helping people, but it's not the same as having a full degree of freedom. Sometimes this presents cool challenges like the giant spider inside the cave. But other times, said challenges can feel like padding. Oh, there's an insta-kill obstacle in your way? Then take the extra long road to overcome it. And that's my problem. Because depending on the context, I can be having fun or be on autopilot wishing to get to my destination already. A huge step back about the train was the fast travel. In Phantom Hourglass, it was as easy as meeting a frog, drawing the corresponding symbol, and that was it. Spirit Tracks made it more like... Castlevania Symphony of the Night, where you go through gates connected in pairs. Say you wanna fast travel to the Snow Realm, you still need to find the specific gate and make sure you activated it beforehand if you want it to work. I don't want to sound like I actively hated the train, no. Because if that was the case, I wouldn't like Spirit Tracks as much as I do. It's still a fun part of the game, just the one that leaves me with the most conflicted emotions. But anyway, then I remember something I know I have always liked about the game. That being the final keyword, Zelda. This is something I've never forgotten. Fans often debate which Zelda, the character, is the best. Most will tell you that it's Skyward Swords. And I will agree with that if it wasn't for the fact that Spirit Tracks Zelda exists. 
This is one of the best incarnations of the princess, if only because she actually does shit in the game. I find it hilarious that they even joke about it. <laughs> I'm a big fan of her because, unlike Link, she does comment on stuff that happens, has great characterization, and adds so much charm to the story. Not like Link is a plank of wood all the time, he does have his highlights, of course, and together they deliver a lot of cute moments. But Zelda herself is a major standout. She starts weak and insecure, but ends up proving herself as a great asset. And I mean that literally! This is the other part of her that is so awesome! She can possess phantoms and aid Link in different ways! She can be a platform, distract other guards, roll into a ball, and go one-on-one -on -one with one of the main antagonists! Just don't let her near any rats. <laughs> Zelda works as a fantastic gameplay mechanic. All the puzzles that involve her are more challenging and have much more thought put into them. Seeing these two work side by side is something I wish other games in the series would do more often. If you were to ask me which of the two games is superior Spirit Tracks, I have a strong attachment to it, but moving that aside, it's objectively the better game. But I don't want to undermine Phantom Hourglass by saying that, because even if the sequel is superior, this one still has enough merits to guarantee a playthrough. The DS Zelda games are a weird specimen, but one I'm glad exists. They are different, but not for the sake of being different. They knew what they had and did the best they could do with it, making them some of the most unique entries in the series. Unfortunately, due to their essence, they might not be for everyone, and that is okay. But I don't think it's necessary to say they needed to have a traditional control scheme to be better. Don't be like this skeleton that outright tells you complaining about that is dumb. After so many years of not playing them, I could recall I really liked these games. But after this video, I can say that once again, but also add that I appreciate them more for what they are. And I consider them worthy follow-ups to the Wind Waker, which, oh, surprise, it's my favorite Zelda. They were creative, original, and extremely fun.